Well, welcome to Live from My Drum Room. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I'm very excited to have my guest today, a, a dear old friend and a, just a phenomenal musician, Gary Husband. Uh, Gary, as I'm sure you all know, is a multi-instrumentalist, a drummer, uh, a keyboard player, a pianist, composer, arranger, producer. He does it all. And uh, just a multi-talented spectacular musician all the way around and you know Gary's recording and performing credits are literally staggering when you stop and look at everything he's done his body of work is just incredible uh, including John McLaughlin Billy Cobham Alan Holdsworth of course Jeff Beck Gary Moore level 42 and the list goes on and on and on um, just a uh, an accomplished musician in, in every way. Um, his latest project, The Trackers, uh, is, is what he's, we're going to talk about a little bit today and play some of their music. And uh, with that, I'd like to welcome, live from my drum room, my guest today, the legendary and the great Gary Husband. All right. Welcome, Gary. John, it's so great to see you. Man, it's so great to see you too. It's so, thank you. Thank you for being here today. Oh man, it's my uh, pleasure. You know, I've been hoping this would happen for a long time. And, uh, and I know it's been such a time that we haven't seen each other. I know, so, I know. Uh, well, thank you for being patient. I've been hoping for a long time too. And as I said, I, I'm, you know, I, you were like at the top of my list a while ago. And then as things do with me, they, <laughs> things get away from me, but, but here we are now. And I'm so honored to have you here and so happy to see you. Oh, man, it's, it's such a pleasure, really. You know, I'm the, I'm the one uh, thankful here. that was reaching out to me and uh, it gives us an excuse to just get together again and, and talk like we, we, literally haven't seen each other since what 2005 was that the ginger i think the ginger the, the ginger uh tribute was 2008 believe it or not by 15 almost yeah oh, it feels yeah. longer i know i know boy um i, I know that you know we'll talk about that too i i, I definitely want to um because for for those of you who don't know this we when i was at zildjian uh i produced a tribute to ginger baker in london in 2008 and, and it, very uh, it was nearly an amazing happened. evening <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah and uh it was just a phenomenal evening to 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 pay tribute to the great ginger baker and uh so many great performances including my friend right here gary husband on keyboards and a band that simon phillips phillips put together with the great ray russell on guitar yes. and and uh, tony levin yeah. on bass yeah, Simon on drums. And Keith Carlock. And Keith Carlock also played, that's right, yeah. with with yeah, with members of that band and yeah. and uh yeah, and and Gary, you know, I mean, and there was the great Gary Husband, one of the greatest drummers in the world, just up there just killing it playing keyboards like <laughs> you know, as you do, as you do. Yeah. That's kind of <laughs> way too kind of. Oh, no, absolutely. Crazy. And you know, Gary, let me so and and that that's a great little segue because I should know the answer to this question having known you for as long as I have. But keep were keyboards that was your first instrument? Is that what you started on and then went to the drums, or did it happen around the same time? Oh, you know. <laughs> I don't know. No, no the, the keyboards came. Did you hear that by the way? Yeah, I heard a little of it. You know, it's the the. the uh, the Zoom thing cuts out a little of it. It was just a joke, but no, no. <laughs> piano came first, actually. I, I, uh, yeah. I, I was really grateful to, unfortunate to have um, uh, classical piano lessons, which was, which was uh, a real um, sort of test of the of of all your senses, really. You know, survival skills, really, just as. Yeah. I have classical piano lessons. I mean, this is serious, serious stuff. And 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 my teacher was particularly brutal, you know, 
a lot of them are and you know violence and intimidation were the order of the day you know oh, so, i mean it, it really was a kind of i mean if you can get through that it, it was uh you can kind of get through anything really it's a lot a lot of my first early gigs were like that too in big bands and things like that just yeah, yeah. just surviving them really and you you were pretty young when you started on on piano that was the problem oh well it was the problem when i was working in in the big bands and stuff everybody was at least sort of sort of around 20 years older but but um with wow. piano yeah it was i was really i i was sort of gravitating towards that so i'm told that uh as uh before i was 10 i guess you know yeah. you, you you were tr you're trying to play it as soon as you could reach it basically reach the keyboard so I don't remember that, but apparently that's how it was, you know. And then drums came Fantastic. later. I just, yeah. I couldn't resist it anymore, you know. That's, and, and I, I'm probably asking a dumb question, but did the drums come pretty easy to you, having been playing piano and, and understanding rhythms and time and, and, you know, piano being a percussive instrument? I mean, did it... Um, you know, I think it... I think it came easy to read drum music more than, yeah, more than yeah. the actual uh accomplishment and and uh development of of trying to get drums together which which i have to say was it was largely on my own really it was me and listening to records and you know that's what i thought yeah yeah, yeah. so it, to 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 really come about it in a very organic non systematic non sort of regimented way, you know, which was the complete opposite to, to classical piano. Right? So, mm -hmm. Whoa, it was a complete antithesis to that. So, yeah. uh, and, and to approach an instrument very, very organically and instinctively as drums. So th that, that was a great day. Unfortunately, my piano teacher didn't think so. So uh. I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> and pupils get fired? Yeah, sure they can, yeah. Oh, so he, he was he was disappointed that you were she. kind of she yeah. she that you were I don't want to use the word dumbing it down but she she felt that you were sacrificing your talents by playing drums oh or something like that well it was just you know it just wasn't to be done you know this was inferior music you know it, they used to they used to you know back in the classical circles particularly at that time uh, when they weren't calling classical musicians, classical percussionists or instrumentalists, straight musicians. Did you ever, uh, mm -hmm. you probably heard that. Yes, yes. Uh, straight's got a whole new <laughs> thing about <laughs> But straight, straight, straight players, they used to call classical musicians, mm. straight players. And, and also. Um, or legit too, or another one, right? Legit. Legit too, but, a, but the, the yeah. really offensive one was like serious music. Yeah, like yeah. everything else was inferior in terms of its relevance or importance or standard or merit or whatever. Serious music was classical music. Serious. So I left serious music to become uh, <laughs> rebellious and free. But but all these experiences, John, it's just like in life, isn't it, man? So you, you just go through a myriad of... of of uh, experiences that all sort of work together to kind of form you bit by bit and 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 and, uh, and a lot of that stuff stays with you it did with me yeah so i i could take bits of the piano to the drums but it, it was more conceptually than anything else i think i could i had a i had an understanding not just through the piano playing but the theory so i had understand uh, more of an understanding of music conceptually and, mm -hmm. and in terms of form and song form and in terms of uh, definitely in terms of reading, because that was like really easy after classical piano. So I'll bet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Worked yeah. Out. And, and yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I wondered that and that, that makes perfect sense, as you say, because it, it, I mean, if you could master and you could you could become accomplished at classical piano, I'd have to think that the reading the drum charts, as you say, would be you'd have such a uh, gigantic head start on someone trying, you know, just trying to read drum charts, drum parts. Because yeah. you've you understand all that now. And 
Yeah. 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 Because it's the fourth day from the, and you're reading a lot of elaborate notation as far as if you've got snare drum on the sea on the, on the sea space, for, for example. So yeah, it, and it, I, I would... it's easier. But of course the syncopation, once 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 drum charts become a little tricky and syncopated, you know, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sort of belittling uh how complex that can be. No, because it, sure. it is. But but in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's a simpler experience to read kind of that way as opposed to sort of hills and valleys. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, it's expression it's, marks. You don't really get expression marks in drum music. So, yeah, apart yeah. from it, it, shut the fuck up or, you know, <laughs> or stay in time or uh, use, use full kit, go crazy, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah. No, it blows my mind to to hear you play piano the way you do and 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 drums. I mean, I became aware of you really from your drumming with Alan, Alan the great Alan Holdsworth, and yeah. and uh, and I, I think I, I I guess I found out maybe through as we were talking about our friend mutual friend Colin Schofield, yeah. or maybe it might have been Dennis Chambers. Someone had said somewhere along the line, you know, you should hear Gary play keyboards, and I'm like, oh, cut it out come on this guy plays keyboards too and then i as i learned more about you and i got to know you i realized that as you said that was your what i thought to be your first instrument and as you say it was and um but man i you know before i brought you on gary i just i just read to the audience just some of your credits and i'll say it again they're just staggering i mean just <laughs> just just the the really just the tip of the iceberg and this is a fraction i know of what you've done but um, of course, being a multi-instrumentalist, if we've talked about composer, arranger, producer, credits include John McLaughlin, Billy Cobham, the late, great Alan Holdsworth, the late, great Jeff Beck, Gary Moore, Level 42. Um, it's just, it's, it's incredible. And you've still got lots more music to make, I know. And mm. um, and I was just going to also say your latest project, The Trackers, which you were kind enough to send me some of the music and we'll play some of that today. And it's just, it's fabulous stuff. Man. Oh, thanks, man. I was hoping you'd dig it. I was, I was really hoping because it was, it's not really a, it's not really a jazz record. It's not really a fusion record, except it's a fusion or represents a very different kind of fusion. At least it did for me. So it was a very new experiment to do that. Yeah, it was, uh, I, re I really like that record a lot that's congratulations Thanks. it's yeah well done i know i know this was a if you don't mind i i, I want to read to everyone something that i uh, extracted from the promo that you sent me okay and th and this is this is a quote from you that uh and i know this had to have been a really difficult time for you when alan holdsworth passed i lost a very close and special long-term musical relationship immensely central to my ongoing development and creativity as a drummer. To ease the pain of that loss and the sheer void it brought about, I knew I had to start something new, build myself a new way to continue. And, and that was the kind of the impetus to, to the trackers, correct? Yeah, yeah, it really was, yeah. yeah. I, I had to sort of, I had to build a new realm um, in which uh, that I could not continued that style but 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 it but but something to occupy the creative place and and and, and the, the 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 way to play drums in something as i could with that although of course yeah. Yeah. ready to take on all the differences you know because of course it's it's nothing's going to be like alan's music I, yeah i said yeah. no to a lot of alan tributes and stuff to, to play this music I was like, no, there's, there's, there's no uh, music. Doesn't, that music didn't make sense without him, you know. Yeah, it just doesn't. Yeah. And I, the day we lost him, it was like, well, that's it. Oh, yeah. that's that's it. I can't go. I can't go back and play that music with somebody else. I just can't do that. So, but some of the guys can, you know, Chad's doing yeah. it, and and Jimmy Haslip and stuff. So, I mean, that, that's great. Yeah. They can they can all do that. I can't. Maybe maybe it was just too deep. I I understand that. Yeah, I was going to say. I think, not to say Chad didn't have the same emotional connection no, to Alan, but certainly did. But but I yeah 
Yeah, but I, but I think you you know you you process it differently, and and that's that's how you process it. And I I get it, man. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a heavy. But we've lost yeah. a few, haven't we, dear John? I know, I know, I know. And and and, and I certainly don't want to, you know, we don't want to uh, bring everybody no, down. No. <laughs> Watching, no, no. But I but I I just I thought that was beautiful what you said. Because, you know, I, I, I think like a lot of people, I associate you mostly with Alan uh, and all the years and all the great yeah. work. Yeah. Oh, that's nice, man. Thank you. Yeah. 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 But it was, this is, I, and I, I will, like I say, I will play some of the music, but um, I also want to talk about just some of these other, I know you, you play regularly with Billy Cobham and, and uh, we had a question, in fact, from someone about that that I'll get to in a minute, but I just look at, the artists that you've played with, and we're the same age. You and I were born the same year, 1960. Oh, shh, and... Don't tell me. <laughs> I'll never get hired again. <laughs> Sorry about that. As I said, 1980. We were both born in 1980. And uh... that's right. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> but I, I look at like we have the same heroes. I, I know many of the same heroes, and and the big difference is you're Gary Husband, phenomenally talented. <laughs> and you've played with all these these greats and you know like mm. just talking about like we, we both grew up in the era of cream for example and we you know we talked about the ginger tribute but you know and then you go on to play with the great jack bruce mm. and maybe you could maybe you could even just talk about how that even that came about like how the connection to jack and um was it through working with alan or was it through working with billy or well if you can believe it the 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 eventful night that, that that I met Alan, which was was uh, during one of my very very last gigs with uh, a group called Barbara Thompson's Paraphernalia, and um, uh, I'd been playing in that band and and fired, you know, which was kind of commonplace <laughs> in those days. No, I agree. I, I think it was exactly right. <laughs> I was way over the top and way too loud. And, uh, you know, that was just the thing. But she took the bass player too, Roy Babington. So, uh, but then he was a, a little bit of a co-conspirator. You know, I, you can, <laughs> how it is with music, man. It's like you get a combination of two guys who want to stir something up and it's um, uh, better just get rid of both of them kind of thing. So <laughs> I'd done that. And I was, it was my last few sort of shows. I think we, we were doing a week at Ronnie Scott's and... Um, I think it was, it might have been the penultimate night, in fact, to the very last night. And uh, and a friend of mine who was there that night said uh, they'd seen Alan come into the club and Jack Bruce. And and uh, the, the thing, thing about that was that they were actually working on something together. Funnily enough, it was with John Heisman, who was married to Barbara Thompson. Oh, wow. And, and, okay. and Alan, Jack... And John were doing a trio. In fact, there's there are some sort of outtake, uh, you know, lo-fi demos around. I think it's called the Sherwood Sessions because it was done in Nottingham, maybe or something. Anyway, uh, and um, and they'd done four tunes um, together. And of course, Jack was singing, playing bass, and alongside sort of that that endeavor which which never came to anything actually that they were having a great deal of trouble just trying to sort of sell it really because of, of really the stature of jack up against alan and then uh i don't know really about john you know it's difficult to to tell but um so that really wasn't working out for sort of extra musical reasons and uh and I thought, well, the cl the club was really full. Um, I thought, so I went down to the downstairs bar. You probably remember the downstairs bar, right? At Rock. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, lots of fun to be had down there. Anyway, um, uh, the first person I bump into, and I nearly did walk straight into him, was Alan. Wow. So, and he he. True enough, he was in the club. He'd seen a bit of the set and stuff. And he was like, oh, man, you've just been playing. You know, I really enjoyed that. You know, and I was like, wow. 
I said, you, you probably, I'm Alan. You probably don't know that. I said, no, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, I don't suppose you sort of uh, think you, there's any chance we could sort of have a play, do you? Or uh, something. I said, wow. Yeah. I said, well, I could sort of, you know, got a room available to me. I could probably take it on Sunday. And um, I said, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me check my book <laughs> yeah let me let me get back to you on <laughs> and now of course i said no man i'd love to and uh, that was just a, a a really kind of interstellar experience um but the the thing was that that i was i also got introduced to jack that night and he he'd uh, he'd been looking sort of forward to you know getting to to do something different anyway and there was an improvising thing coming up at a famous pub in um south london called the plow which used to feature a lot of sort of wild free acts you know like john stevens mm -hmm. away and all these kind of maniac um freeform guys and uh and i ended up playing with jack uh on one of these really kind of free things of many of which Alan had done previously. Uh, yeah. And we were, we were there playing free and it was, it was too much. And it was really too much because actually, no, if I remember it rightly, Jeff Berlin was, was, was playing bass, but Jack was in the audience. He got up to sit in. So that, that actually documents the, the first time uh, I was able to play with Jack. So long story short, you know, that, that, there was something there and uh, and of course not it didn't come to anything because jack was doing different things straight away and alan wanted to go with me for for mm. the idea of the three piece and jack had started working with john mclaughlin and uh, Stu goldberg and billy cobham at that point 79 i was going to ask you about what year yeah, yeah. wow about that yeah that, that's what it is so that sort of predates anything that came on came up later um it must have been around uh uh early 80s no sorry early uh 90s uh that i somehow got drafted in with jack and i don't know how who it came through it came through somebody or a result of some kind of meeting and i can't remember what what that was but he needed something and he was like yeah you you know why don't you come and play I'm like, yes <laughs> oh man what a great idea <laughs> i mean thank you you know and yeah, i was yeah. like but i have to say you know this was he was such an unbelievable so unique so unique i mean just from the point of view where of of where a bass player puts notes in, in a kind of regular, more typical situation, more usual situation, more commonplace. He had none of that. Everything was in the least unex least expected place yeah. that he'd put yeah. things. And uncannily, you can hear evidence of, of how both unique, how unique both Jack and Ginger were in the in the cream things. Because when you listen to the the, what's going on behind Eric Solos? We used to discuss this a lot uh, with some friends. That there was kind of an uncanny thing where Jack, it just instinctively would put stuff right in the holes that Ginger left. Yeah, you know, yeah. My yeah. God, that's and none of it was like anything. I mean, there was Ginger sort of with this kind of conceptual upside down beats, almost like with the. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. The way the snare and the one on the three kind of thing, and it's all built around the snare on the one and three, and all the the bass drum stuff comes in all these different places. Yeah. So the backbeat is sort of kind of reversed, and yeah, that's and you hear Jack, on a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah, and you hear Jack sort of reacting to that, but it was always constantly shifting. It was always con constantly spontaneous with him, and every single night was was uh, completely different. And it was like playing with one of the most incredible improvising or jazz musicians you can imagine, because it was just yeah. the most uh, 
every night was so completely different. And I have to say that the challenge to me it really it probably represented one of the most challenging things that I've, I've ever done out of all the things that you've been kind enough to to read out there John uh this this was really challenging and and I think one of the responsibilities of the drama or any music musical participant is to really take seriously what you're doing in these positions if you're lucky enough to sort of get awarded with a position like that better take it seriously and and for me jack was an intense study to that end you know uh just to try to figure out i mean what was what was interesting to me was trying to figure out who his favorite players were and i i'd i kind of interview him about that you know i'd find out yeah. or read his interviews which was not easy pre internet but but there were still <laughs> magazines around <laughs> as you could still kind of lift them up and read them you know and it, yeah, it yeah glasses in those days but you know and uh and i'd find out a lot just through the spoken word uh and somehow you can feel if 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 a musician gravitates to to want to talk about a certain artist perhaps over another one because they take they talk longer about him and there were certain ones he talked about mm -hmm. tony a lot he talked about ginger a lot in spite of a kind of a lot of yeah, friction yeah. going, you know, there's a lot of antagonism, as you well know, John, between those two. So yeah, um, yeah, and and in a way that was kind of necessary to their musical arrangement. You know, it was kind of necessary to how yeah how it all worked out between those two as as players on a spontaneous kind of level all the time. So. I was very happy, but but what I wasn't happy about was how the job I was doing, and and I think I had a comp tendency to to probably play it a little safe, if that would be the right way to do it. To play more, to play a little straighter, a little more mm -hmm. literally or typically than yeah than, reserved even maybe than he would and he yeah. would he would kind of say things you know he would say different like a bit like a zen master you know uh because i cared to ask him mm -hmm. and i'd say jack you know how's it all you know it's, it's great man you know, i'm we're having so much fun and i'm glad to see that you appear to be from time to time too <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, i say uh you know is is there anything that you wanted to talk to me about you know in, in respect of how it how it feels you know anything you want to discuss with me and he said well uh you know gary uh, it's uh you know it's all good you know it's all really good but sometimes if you could just wait okay mm. stop there I'm like, well, okay, so what does that mean if you could just wait but but in a way it's like the object with those kind of Zen masters, so they would plant a seed in you that would that would start you thinking and using your own mm -hmm. instinct to come up with the answer to what you think they were asking you. Yeah, That's what yeah. I do, you know. And he 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 really set. Um, and I think you have to care enough to to. I, and I cared, you know. It wasn't like hey, you know, calling him any name under the sun. Have this. This is this is what you need. This. I wasn't, yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't into that. I wanted to be everything he wanted of me, and I knew that it wasn't going to be commonplace. I knew that it would be quite involved. Only I, I, I couldn't get it for a long time. But I play. I try to play good and dutifully, and and try to get it. Um, it wasn't until fast forwarding ninety seven or ninety eight or something. I had a completely out of the blue call from um, Jack, who was down the road, not a million miles from where we're living actually now, a place called Smokehouse Studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of great records were done there. And it was a really great analog studio, fantastic old, you know, MCI board. Anyway, um, fantastic. A lot yeah. of vintage gear and stuff. And, uh, uh, and he was making an album with Robin Trower. And he said, um, 
Gary, man, we, you know, we've been in here. We've had another situation happening for a couple of days. I'm not happy. I thought, oh, okay, no, sorry about that. Sorry to hear. He said, so can you come down and, uh, you know, see how it works out, man? You know, we really need you. I was like, really? I said, of course, I'd be, I'd be over the moon too. You know, and I, I to, to this day, I have no idea who it was. Uh, but this this turned out to be an album called Seven Moons, and it was Jack and Robin Trower. Wow. I think that was the third album that they'd done together over the years. It was, it was yeah. like a sort of number three. And um, and I got in and it was so, it was so old school. I mean, the studio was anyway, but but just to see Robin's because the first time of meeting and playing with Robin Trower. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it was just amazing, but it, it was so ridiculously old way, you know. And he had a little uh, black Sony Walkman, you know, with the with the, I guess a little speaker on board or whatever, or at least one of the Walkmans that had a sp internal speaker. Mm -hmm. And he plays demos through that. He said, "So this is what we're gonna. <laughs> this is the next one we're gonna do, fellas. You know, <laughs> that's about the feel of it. Yeah, that's about the right tempo. Yeah." <laughs> No click, just get wow. there. So I'm just scrambling about. I've got a little metronome there. I'll make a rough note of what it was uh, and just sort of get that click ready for, all right, count us in, you know, that moment, you know. <laughs> and, um, oh, man. So, uh, and we did it, and and they were quite simple songs, but, but as always with Jack, there were always little, little, things to catch you out you know yeah yeah complexities and an interest a lot of interest about it that's a better way of putting it anyway yeah. we got through these songs i've got a handle of their shape and stuff and uh we did two on the run and they were very they seemed really happy uh we we listened to we played both things and then we said why don't we go and listen to those and see how they're sounding and uh Robin was going, wow, this sounds really good. Cause he had no idea of uh, my name at all or who I was, but but he he'd taken the word of Jack, who had obviously sort of been giving him like, hey man, I've got the guy exactly right for this, and he's just up the road. So can I call him or can I call him? Uh, yeah. And and Robin was, well, well, you know, don't know, and this and that and this. So we'd come off, gone in the control room and had two playbacks. And Robin said, wow, that sounds really good. I'm really happy with that. And Jack says, see? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was obviously, it, there'd obviously been some kind of, you know. Yeah, back, backstory back. to that, yeah. But, but Oh, man. <laughs> what Long preamble, what I've really getting around to say is that was the first time I think of in any time that I really got it together how to play with him I was yeah. using kind of using I took I took the looseness of ginger I took the untypical kind of fragmented thing and and the placement of of ginger in a way as an essence not not yeah yeah no transcriptions and I took the to I took the hire of Tony Williams, who he adored. Yeah, yeah. And I had it. I had it really lazy. Yeah, and it yep. and it was like this kind of feel, and, and Jack was able to sort of get into that kind of Jack uh, feel. Yeah, somewhere between the the swung and the even. Do, 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 mm -hmm. do, 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 you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it was all going with my relaxed old kind of, it was almost like an old kind of Dixieland feel on the hi hat. And, and, uh, and I got it. And he's, man, you're sounding good these days. Happy with that. And I was like, yeah. It, it, and, and for me, it really, I felt, I came away from that studio first day thinking, finally got how to play with Jack. Genius move, Gary. It, that, you, you really figured that out. It, it took a while. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was wow. still the player he was, you know, in, at least yeah. Yeah. In, by his instinct. And I go, well, that's, that's, that hasn't changed, obviously. 
and I think he just needs something from me. He doesn't need a like, uh, you know, a conventional, right on it, literal, everything mm-hmm. tight, yeah. and powerful, spirited, whatever else that's great. He needs the unexpected. Well, you know, that's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think it, I'm, I'm most familiar with Jack's work with Cream, probably like a lot of people, but I know he's, he did, you know, his, his body of work was just incredible. But, um, yeah. but to your point, you know, to, to, to incorporate that sort of ginger looseness that Tony, you know, you know, his work with Tony, of course. Um, cause I, I found when I, as I got older and I would listen to cream records more critically as a, as a, a, a you know, a more formed drummer, so to speak, it would sound to me like where most bands follow the drummer, that band was following Jack. Like Jack was kind of yeah. right. I mean, taking the role of the guy just, you know, I mean, he, I mean, Ginger too, bless his heart. I mean, he, he was a big, important partner in that, but yeah. Jack drove that band, man. Like his, his bass part was just, you know, nothing like it. There was nothing like his sound, his, his feel where, like you said, perfectly too, where he put those weird little notes and accents where, yeah, yeah, you, you couldn't just play that song straight and play with him. You had to really figure out where those places were to kind of make it fit. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and we did, uh, you know, first band was trio was with a, a guitarist called Blue Saracino. Oh, sure. Yeah. I remember Blues. Yeah. yeah. And we, that was the first three piece I played with in Jack. And then that kind of morphed into, because I started meeting Gary Moore through Jack. Yeah. And he did a couple of depths for Blues. And he was yeah. quite keen on the way it felt between us three. So that changed into. Sort of a, a, a kind of automatic shift into that three piece, but I, I wasn't I wasn't good for it, John. I, I didn't deliver what it needed. And when I hear it now, I, I, I'm even it, it's terrible when you when you kind of like de- a little bit depressed down in yourself about the what your your contribution to something at the time. But years later, it's twice as bad. <laughs> Oh uh, man, I I I'll, I'll bet you're being really hard yeah, on yourself. Yeah, I I, I am. You know, I, 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 I I know you I'm are. Yeah. But but the the thing was, but but it really brings back this 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 euphoria that I felt recording Seven Moons with uh, Jack and Robin because and it wasn't really we we did take the trio on the road for a, f- a few little jaunts, but Jack wasn't wasn't strong and. Was not, mm. not well, yeah, you know? yeah, but and it wasn't really that long, um, for him, you know, before we lost him, bless him, and then, um, but at least I had that, and it was, there was something quite, you know, poignant that, that absolutely it took all yeah. that time, but that, that's the measure of the, of the beast he was, John. It, it was so unorthodox. And yeah, and it yeah. and I've, he never really told me. He never really helped me. He always. This was so old school. He always sort of plant the seed and let you come up with it. Yeah, Zen master. That was the perfect description. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. Yeah. No, I, if I, if you if you let me share a quick Jack story, and I my my only experience was with the ginger tribute we did, and um, you know, <laughs> leading up to it, I was I was communicating with Margaret, his wife. And then Jack and I began to communicate directly about just song ideas and what to do. And then when we met at, I'd met him one time a million years back. Well, I guess not a million years, almost 20 years earlier when him and Ginger were out doing some gigs together and uh, in the early 1990s. And I, I had a quick introduction to him, but he didn't remember it. But anyway, so it's 2008. We're at the venue and doing the rehearsals. And, uh, and he was just so sweet. And I was, as you know, as you, as you pointed out, the relation. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I was I was concerned. I'd had many warnings, probably from yourself, from others about getting Ginger and Jack in the same room together. Oh, this could be a big mistake, and and it was great. And and to Jack's credit, you know, he he was there to support Ginger. He was so I, I don't know how else to ex- explain it, Gary. But and you saw it because you were there. But he was he was so. Um, 
agreeable to really anything Ginger wanted to do yeah. because he knew that the night was to celebrate Ginger. So I kept thanking him for being there. And he was like, don't be silly. It's, you know, it's a, it's an honor to be here. And at one point in the rehearsal, do you remember they, they did a song called train time? Um, Ginger playing the brushes. Oh yeah. 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 Was, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, at the rehearsal, Jack pulled me aside and said, you know, we used to do this song called train time and just, just me and Ginger and Ginger played the brushes and I played the harmonica. And he said, yeah. if, and I, I hope if Ginger's daughter's watching this, I hope she doesn't get upset by me saying this, but Jack said, if I suggest it, he'll, he'll say no. Yeah, that's but, if right. you but, but if you he suggest it, it yeah, okay. he, yeah, he might go along with it. Yeah. And I said, uh, I said, okay, let, let, that's a great idea. Let's, let's, let's do that, you know? And I, I didn't know the tune and I'd forgotten it. So I, I said to Ginger, went back to where Ginger was in a different room. And I said, hey, Ginger, wasn't there a tune where you played brushes, uh, train time or something? And, and Jack played harmonica and he went, yeah. And I said, maybe you could do that as one of the songs. He said, well, I don't know if Jack's going to want to do it. If Jack's okay, I'll do it. But he, he probably won't want to. <laughs> so I went back and mentioned it to Jack. And Jack, you know, comes in and he said, hey, Ginge, John mentioned, uh, you know, you're up for doing train time. I, that's a great idea. Yeah, let's do it. And I swear to God, Gary, they, they, they ran it down one time and it was like it was perfect okay. at the rehearsal. Yeah. As you know, I mean, when, when, when these guys are, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many years they're apart. They were such a, a, a unique rhythm section. Yeah. That they could just it just fell right back oh, in. And so anyway, that. they. Yeah. Yeah. So it, Jack was, um, and at the end of the night, you know, we went back to the K West hotel. If you remember a little after show party and, and, uh, Jack said to me, uh, listen, you have my number. Um, I consider you a friend and I expect you to stay in touch. Like he was sort of like lecturing me and, and, and saying it. And I said, man, I, I thank you for everything. And, and I will stay in touch. And I think I was in touch a couple of more times, but I, I think it wasn't not, it wasn't long after that, that we lost him. Um, mm. Yeah, but um, anyway, thanks for letting me share that that Jack story. It's yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Great, great yeah, anytime. It's, it's it's yeah. It's so lovely to to share stories yeah. and talk about them. Yeah, yeah. But um, sure. I want to read you. There are a couple of great questions that came through too that I want to. Um, some of these you might have seen. Yeah, I sent all those. <laughs> under different names yeah nice work <laughs> well you might know this gentleman uh an old friend of mine and i think he's a friend of yours roger Bowandu from bordeaux fine man great drummer and he said i have three oh. questions for young gary husband <laughs> <laughs> um and and he said you'll choose johnny d but but i'll, I'll just what was your thought when you heard for the first time, your composition uh, "City Night," played by Alan with Vinny, on Secrets. Well, I uh, I lost some hair, and uh, <laughs> I, I, no man. I, I mean, I was knocked out really because I had no idea. Um, we'd uh, I was meant to be attending the session, but in in actual fact, I mean, I played my parts on it at the beginning around the time yeah. uh, Alan was like interested in that song and um, and we kind of sequenced it up as it were at, at his house not long really before that album was supposed to happen because he'd, he'd, I just played him a, a demo I had of it and he said no I really want to use it I want to do it and and since I was in uh, Costa, uh, not Costa Mesa um, Tustin and uh orange county yeah probably. yeah anyway um and uh he said we can uh i've got my oberheims in the back you can go in and uh sequence it up if you like and i said we can do that here and i think well fantastic great uh yeah let's do that and uh and then you've got the version so i played everything on it i played um the the whole of the kind of tune and of course, it was mm -hmm. it was kind of all sequenced up, and exactly would be the length that it was recorded, obviously. And um, um, and that was it. And uh, Alan took it. The next thing I knew, um, 
Jimmy Johnson and Vinny had been in one take. Wow. One take. <laughs> wow. Uh, I didn't know that. It was apparently in that one take, he wreaked the damage on the entire <laughs> drum community, um, you know. And uh, it, it was amazing. I mean, I, of course it was amazing. I had absolutely yeah. no sort of conception of of that that he'd 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 approach it in that way. I mean, the funny thing was, I mean, as the writer of that thing, I had a kind of, kind of conception on my original demo, demo, I had a beat and it was kind of a bit like the kind of beats I used to do with Al and kind of like a played, played forward wise and then played in reverse, like a sort of question and answer thing. And, mm -hmm. um, and it was much more of a kind of rigid beat. It wasn't really improvisational at all. So to hear... The first time what Vinny done, you know, with this, this, this going absolutely nuts in this yeah, an amazing yeah. way. Uh, and I just thought it was just, it was an amazing statement. Other than that, I hated oh. it. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fantastic. It was a really amazing moment. What, 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 a, what a surprise. My God. Yeah. And what yeah. a performance. Wow. Really. And and, and they, yeah. they talk about it as Vinny's even spoken to me about it and said that's one of his favorite all time enjoyed sessions yeah. ever. It's like on the the top five or whatever, you know. That's saying something that yeah, you know, no. to you as the composer. That's that's something to be so proud of. Ah, that's no, no, no. yeah, I, absolutely. He he really just worked that's that's this one of the, only one of the uh, you know many vast things that makes Vinny so great is the fact that he just brings gold to something in, mm -hmm. in ways that only he can do and uh, yeah that that was a shining glowing vibrant example of exactly that yeah, yeah. I, I agree I you know and I, I'll just take a second and say I think we all know about Vinny's incredible technique you know his sheer like you know inhuman but i think what you're saying gary is so true and that his ears and how he interprets things and how he you know his creativity is maybe sometimes a little overshadowed by his actual you know ability on the instrument what he can actually do on the instrument yeah yeah it's it's because so much of what and i'll put you in that category too of what you guys do is is before you actually sit down on the keyboard or the drums you've got to interpret it and you've got to hear it a certain way to then translate it into what you translate it to and that's that's a huge part of it you know it's um i certainly appreciate that well i i really appreciate you saying that too man but i remember saying to alan i said now you now you've played with this guy you know uh <laughs> like everything's different i mean that's like in, in regards to sort of going i said you've, you you know you've gone from from me to him and that must be like going from a tractor to a lamborghini or something you know so <laughs> <laughs> no way but no you know way. no <laughs> i mean it's fun. but in, in terms of sort of refinement and and uh, i mean just the way he's developed he's just, he's a great great artist i mean i have my yeah we all have our little thing don't we Yes, indeed. Yep. And I, I just have to tell you, I've told you this a million times, but I, for, I want everybody watching to know this, that I probably did 500 drum clinics over the years with Dennis Chambers, our dear friend, the great Dennis Chambers. And, yeah. and invariably, whenever anybody would ask, and it would be always a question at the clinic, who are your favorite drummers? And sometimes he'd say Buddy Rich, but he would always say these three drummers, Tony Williams, Billy Cobham, Gary Husband, always. Yes, I paid him for years, you know. <laughs> it was like a long-standing contract, you know. <laughs> no, I had to I, apologize I for certain you. periods during that arrangement, but but I always kind of made up. I was always good for it, you know. No, he had to be paid. <laughs> no, obviously. No, he, he what a sweetheart. I didn't, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. It must have been some kind of trauma 
or no we blow we'd to be, the head we'd be traveling <laughs> we'd be traveling we'd on, a, on an airplane sitting side by side he'd have his headphones on and he'd take his phones off and put them on my head and go listen to this check this out and it would be you on a holdsworth record or something and he's, he's like you listen you, you hear that you hear that you know and and dennis is somebody that's so passionate about that stuff he's like yeah just just check this shit out man just check this out you know yeah yeah, I know, but yeah, he he's never stops listening. Yeah, you know? it's a great a great testament. I want to read you another question that I think many people have asked the same question, an an obvious one, and how your piano keyboard skills influence your drumming. How how would you? And we sort of talked about that at the beginning, but yeah, how would you best describe that? Um, <clears throat> I think kind of probably along the same, similar lines that, that, that I mentioned before and, and in that the the the, the piano gives uh, kind of offers conception to the drummer it, it 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 makes you aware of things in a much more broad and vast way and you have a more complete way of understanding things and and and, and the logic kind of speaks to you and is opened up i think that. yeah but in terms of um which you know, I distinguish this, this sort of conceptual benefits, you know, along with another thing, physical. Uh, you know, and if you if you see really from going to drums to to piano, for example, drums give a a real um, fluency in your independence to 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 the to the keyboards no doubt about it it, yeah, it really yeah. does you know particularly if you get into this you know like left leading and switching both sides and and, and doing this and 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 really you know it's kind of testament to to how all four limbs are working yeah um sounds... but but what you bring what you can bring to the to the keyboards from having that background or having that kind of present within you all the time because my life as a drummer is, is always with me, even though I'm playing piano and, and vice versa. So and it really just kind of benefit and, and liberate uh, syncopation or abilities to be able to sort of achieve things without kind of thinking about it so much. It's just the independence and and that stuff is kind of open and 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 uh, open to interpretation. That's, and that's what's really nice. So it, it really equips the pianist with that. But the other way around, yeah. probably the, it's probably a little more subtle what, what the piano gives drums, you know. Mm -hmm. Do you, Did you find when you started playing drums, um, were, you, were you aware of um, your timing and just how, because you, you started playing with other musicians at a really young age. So mm -hmm. did you did you find that um, I know that, again, as myself, as a young drummer, I wasn't aware of my time being bad until I got a little older and realized, oh, shit, my time, I really need to work on yeah, this. But, same here. Same. But I have to think, though, you as a, as, a, as a pianist must have really developed great time so that when you started playing drums, you, pro I'm guessing, had a really great natural sense of time. You know, you're... you're I think, you know, I mean, with the, with the classical, which is about as far as I got, really, with the with the with the piano a lot of it was about like ab abstract time bendy time mm -hmm. um uh, you you have a lot of elaborate um sort of pieces of information on classical scores directing when rubatos take place when when to you know obviously crescendos and diminuendos but obviously when you if you, if you if the pace picks up for a certain phrase and pulls back and all that all, all of those are kind of written and and they're like the dogma you know to mm, yeah. sort of play pieces like that but i wouldn't say that there was anything really ever in strict tempo uh, i see yeah, so yeah. It, it wasn't like a kind of metric uh yeah. benefit i don't think I and if anything you know it probably influenced my sort of ambiguous timing <clears throat> when I was I don't... younger on the drums. <laughs> uh, again, modesty. Uh, and no, no, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call your timing 
ambiguous by any means, sir. Not one bit. That's oh, nice of you, man. It's very forgiving of you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play some some of uh, the trackers in a second, and uh, I just want to quickly. You and I were talking uh, off the air about a great experience we had together celebrating Elvin Jones' 75th birthday back in, and I, the date would have been 2002. So, man, again, one of these things over 20 years ago. Yeah. 2002, Gary, you and I were teenagers, if, if my math is correct, kids, based man. on kids. Kids, just kids. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, maybe maybe you, you told a great story about, uh, maybe you'll just share that about the photo that you took that night. Oh, should I tell it? Just... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how many watching might be aware of a, a legendary figure of drums called Charlie Persip. And he was one of the many in attendance at the, it was the Blue Note, wasn't it, in New York? It was at the Blue Note in New York. And, yeah, Elvins, yeah. And, and, and everybody was kind of like, hanging around at the bar and it was like literally a who's who of, of just every drums everybody, everybody was there yeah and um and i remember i was lucky enough to be stood at the bar uh at the right at the time elvin walks in with um i never remember her name uh, oh keiko keiko, wife, keiko. keiko, keiko. keiko. yeah yeah because i've got kiki and a kiko and a Koki <laughs> and a, Cookie, yeah. that's me. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all these different variations happening. Anyway, so they walk in, and Elvin's in his um, beautiful uh, big fur coat, you know, walking it. Yeah. He's the life and soul cigar happening. And uh, he's just all personality, and he's wonderful. Right at the moment he walks in, Charlie Persip is there, uh, legendary figure of drums and Jack D. Jeanette and for a fleeting few seconds there are three amazing legends all very very disparate they're very very different but just the pure love and brothership of drummers getting together and the joy of that moment I had a camera and unashamedly I just went you know, got it. And it right like split second after that, Keiko <laughs> runs up to me and goes, Yo, I, I should charge you two thousand dollars for that. <laughs> uh, That's a fair but you know, will you take a check? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll sell it for ten. <laughs> I'll give you two. <laughs> I mean, it didn't get you know, I was expecting ooh, yeah. she's not gonna let's go you know she, she want the film out of my camera next I, you know what whatever was going to happen but she 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 let it go thankfully yeah yeah and i got this picture oh man what a, i know what a, i i wish i i i don't know that i even had a camera that night i don't remember a lot of that night gary i'm not ashamed to say uh, it doesn't surprise <laughs> me john um <laughs> just... <laughs> it was quite a night but, uh, but man i know yeah <laughs> But I know, like you said, though, I mean, it was a who's who of drummers, like every every drummer that I knew in New York and and some of my friends from London, like yourself, were there. And it was a just an amazing night. Wow. And uh, we're so lucky. You know, I, we were talking earlier, just, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer and, and appreciator of the time that we grew up in and, and the music that we got to actually see and the people that we got to know. And uh, I mean, thankfully, they're that music's there forever for other people to enjoy and but to to be there you know to be at elvin's 75th party man that's that's like yeah i know yeah. when we were talking it was it just brought back um so much man god you i i was really fortunate enough to to be attending gigs since since i came to london what 1978 i moved to london so yeah uh, there was still quite a lot happening, you know. There was still a kind of Soho, and yeah, there was there, were, there was a big kind of network of kind of jazz fusion gigs, rock gigs, whatever. Um, and um, but one of the greatest things was that Ronnie Scott's they the, they had just all these amazing artists on a regular basis too. I mean, I saw Billy Higgins, Art Blakey, Jazz Messengers. Wow. Uh, and Elvin 
uh, jazz machine. Yeah. Time after time after time. So Freddie Hubbard with Carl Burnett. I don't know if you ever remember Carl Burnett. Very few, I, no. very few people have heard of him. Amazing drummer. Uh, uh, and there were there were others. You know, I used to see, uh, yeah. did I say Billy Higgins? Anyway, yeah, I used to see a lot of people on a, almost like it seemed like rotation. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. in those weeks, usually kind of a, Two week um, engagement for the for these guys, and usually the last set people would have gone. So I was able to get uh, really close to. I mean, I didn't I didn't have any interest in what the drummers were actually doing physically. I just wanted to feel it. And that's great. And if you can imagine, well, you would probably don't you've been there, uh, but but for a lot of people who who sadly haven't and never will. Sit in front of Elvin Jones's drum kit. Let me tell you. Oh my God! Yeah. I mean, it's like being blasted to Pluto and back. Yeah. And what it it's ex exactly. It's yeah. like your lights up your whole kind of intestinal system, like Cape Canaveral. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Emotionally, what it does to you. I mean, he just annihilating people, not through volume or speed no. or or instant, you know. Or power, but I will say power, but not in terms of just it wasn't playing especially loud always. It was just exactly. It was like something primeval, like a like a something of the earth when he played, and and so kind of wonderfully he had the swagger and this abstract that he had, and you know, and he looked just like he played, and it, yeah the vision was perfect with what you heard and and it really in terms of like what it moved you which i believe music to be the in its best most helpful sense is to really move us take us out of this dimension into another one and to inspire us and and that inspiration stayed with me for life man. and it, and it wasn't just inspiration it was like almost it had gone in and I couldn't get rid of it. It it had gone gone into I, I can still hear now in various solo spots how I'll go into some kind of pet and get a kind of circle a circular thing happening with it. Yeah. And it's going round and round and round. And I'm bringing different things in, I'm leaving different things out. And it's and it's traveling like that. It's like a kind of a you know, I'm like sort of fifth wheel on somebody's spaceship. So it feels like really kind of zane, you know, right out there. And I'm just going with it. It's just a feeling. It's not, it's not a rigid pulse. It's just a, it's like a combination pulse, like several pulses together. And it's all just like delicious together. And that's what, that's what it was like listening to him, to me. Anyway, I'm hogging the conversation. No. Man, I, I, I couldn't have described it any better than what you just said. And, yeah. and I think anybody who, anybody who's ever seen Elvin mm. totally will get what you're saying, Gary, totally will get it. Yeah. In fact, Anthony Cusina, uh, who, who watches all these episodes has just put a comment. Yes. Elvin was father, father earth. Yeah. Father earth. And, uh, yes. Thank yes you. Father earth. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Anthony. And, and no, it was perfect, man. It was like he, it was like he was mixing this incredible, stew or something and and just the way he just conjured things and and uh and i think what you said too like he wasn't like a i mean he certainly hit the drums hard at times Oof, yeah and it could be loud but it was the dynamics that he played with and the way that he could play if they were doing a ballad and he'd you know with brushes and then he'd yeah. come in and with his sticks and it would just be like and it really was such a you know tony was much the same, but in a different way yeah. with his really. incredible power, you know, and yeah, but uh, you know, these, these guys were like, you know, like we'll never see players like this again. We'll never, no, no. I mean, th th these guys were like once in a, in a lifetime, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do I feel really fortunate? I mean, I, I know you feel the same way, John, you as being yeah. similar age. <laughs> similar age <laughs> you're you're six months older than me so i'm a little younger than you <laughs> oh boy yeah, but oh man but yeah. well let's let's 
let's play a couple of songs from the trackers, some some bits of that before we close out for the day. And uh, I'm gonna, if, if you're okay with this, Gary, I'll choose track number four, "The Middle Difference," which you composed. And um, yeah, we'll play a little bit of this.
Yeah, the little James Bond code at the end there. Oh man. Wow. <laughs> I'm I'm sweating from listening to that. Well, I see the, the whole thing, it's like two things. Jimmy Haslip really evokes Jack. Oh my gosh, yeah. And, yeah, the great Jimmy Haslip on bass. Yeah, God. Yeah. Lefty. Yeah. So oh my God, yeah. so right for that track. And uh yeah. Uh that that was one thing, but 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 also there was it was kind of like where where something uh, you know rough and ready or aggressive whatever you want to call it meets kind of romance so every time that kind of sun sun comes out a bit yeah you know, yeah it, uh, it's sort of quite romantic so the working title was romantic rude and uh who said you can't use that, can't use that. <laughs> how about the middle distance hmm anticipating <laughs> Anyway, yeah, but yeah, it's, oh. it's 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 it was just it's a nice record to do, man. It was really really different. Everything was really different about it. So yeah, yeah, really fabulous. And I I think I might have called it the middle difference. It's the middle distance. It I is. apologize if I spoke in incorrectly, but I'm gonna play if you don't mind. Unless there's another track, I was gonna play just a bit of the next track, uh, track five, Wolf Moon, which you play drums, um, organ, and electric piano on and you also wrote okay yeah i'll play i'll play a bit of that as well thank you so yeah absolutely gary thank you
forgotten how nuts that record is, man. <laughs> wow. I've forgotten how man. nuts it is. But but that this this is a, probably a new name on you, right? The, the, this guitarist, Alf, Alf, yeah, Alf Terry Hanna. I mean, he's he's been he's kind of like a national treasure of Norway. I think it's a national treasure of the guitar. Personally, I'm really fabulous. Yeah, it was very very different, and uh, it's one of those great things that can work out in the music kind of thing that he he actually approached me to do a track uh, some years before, and I had no idea what he was doing what kind of music is this you know and uh said, yeah I'll, I'll i'll have a go you know and he loved it and it and i really liked it so it was so uh, it's, it's just great to get together with somebody really different and do something it's, yeah not, it's it's not a jet record it's, at all it's so different and so refreshing and and for everybody uh watching and listening it's the trackers vaudeville 845 and it's yeah. Gary Husband and Alf, if you can, uh, Terje Hanna? Yeah, Terje. Terje, Terje Hanna. Alf, Alf Terje Hanna, yeah, guitars. And, yeah. and Alf did a lot of the writing on there. I'm responsible for some of it. There's a couple of covers. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. And I'll, I'll put the links um, when we put this up on YouTube and, and, and all the places so people can find it. Oh, man, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely, it's really Gary. Yeah. Be talking about it. Well, I, I thank you so much for being here today, and, and I know it's getting late in the UK, so thank you for for sticking with me. Real pleasure. Real, real special pleasure, John. Yeah. Uh, it's been really great to do this. Likewise. Yeah, thank you. And I know, I know. Uh, I, I, I hope we can see each other in person soon. Yeah. Well, be great to do that. I'm getting a U.S. visa soon. So, oh, fantastic. Yeah. All right. Uh, I've got some. Well, I'm coming to LA to do a, a, a thing called the Fantasy Drum Camp. Oh, yes. When, when will that be? But that is the 4th until the 8th of August. And okay. Yeah. And uh, Steve Orkin is the organizer of that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm playing along with uh, Dave Garibaldi, Lana Lewis, Monster He Is. And uh, yes. and uh, it's uh, man, Dave Weckl. Dave does Weckl, that too. Yeah, yes, some yeah. Guy, Dave, some guy yeah. called Dave Weckl. You know, some guy. Yeah. So so yeah, once yeah. again, Steve Orkin. Steve couldn't find any good drummers. So yeah, it's just you and Dave and Larnell and David Garibaldi. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah man, kind of like, what a lineup! It, it is. Uh, it's it's going to be fantastic. But but that's part of the whole buzz, isn't it? Where you feel not a uh, not a not a, a need to be faster or louder or, or more flashier or, or more accomplished or more recorded or whatever, just go and be yourself. And, that, and I think that's yeah. that's out of all of us that like to get involved with coaching and motivating people in the drum thing. It's it it's a very big big fact is to to really find what it is you want to do with that instrument and and yeah. very often it's what you what brought you to the instrument in the first place and and really anybody who comes to a camp like that as well as the tutor if you call us tutors why don't you call us motivators that's better because in a way it is kind of motivating yeah. people to um really kind of just realize some something inner and something special unique to their makeup and, and and try and cultivate that and and sometimes that needs a bit of a coaching just to sort of make people think yeah maybe i can just sort of think about these things and believe in what i've been hearing for a while and and yeah. go for it in those terms so that's one of the many messages and then you find out that the tutors or people there like myself and those amazing drummers are actually still going through it themselves <laughs> so right. we're all learning too in spite of the the age everybody is but it you know the, I, I think that's the important it, it it's like Dave Weckl it's not a relaxed with his resting on his laurels and thinking well I've done this yeah. I've done that no he's driven he's driven to be the, the best he can possibly attain now 
you know, in spite of, and, and as a result of everything he's done and what he can do in the future. And and the same with just about all of the, my biggest heroes anyway, it's all an incredibly forward looking and, uh, and, and great endeavor, you know, and constant endeavor, so. Well said, yeah, you're right. It should be good. So yeah, it's gonna be fantastic. But the thing is, I, I got that, that um, visa to do that. And also I wanna sort of see a lot of old friends, maybe try and hook up with some people and play because it's been a long time since I've been in LA. Great. Well, we'll we'll be in touch before then. That's that's a yeah. little ways off. So I, I there's plenty of time to see if there's any ways of of getting in you know in touch, getting together. But I got some friends in Boston too, so I've got an excuse to come yeah. to the neck of the woods, man. So I, I I hope so. I've got as I told you, I've got this grudge set. Yeah, I'm looking at you. that. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> the Pearl guys won't mind. By the way, Mike Ferris had been says hello from Pearl. Oh yeah. yeah. I want to shout out to, to Mike, our old friend Mike Ferris at Pearl. Brilliant, so. Mike Ferris. Great guy. Oh, beautiful yeah. guy. Yeah. 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 All my best to him. Gary, you're you're a beautiful guy, and I thank you so so much, and and sincerely, and and all the years of our friendship, I I treasure it, and I value it, and uh, I bet, we'll continue. I'm just honored to be on your show, and and I and I wish the same for us too. Uh, yeah. We, thank you. We just keep going. It was such a pleasure to get to get together again and do this. Thank you for asking me. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. Everybody, big hand for Gary Husband, the legendary, Thanks. the one and only. and uh, The old. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's my show. Thanks for listening. You can watch episodes of Live from My Drum Room live in real time on Facebook Live by following my Facebook page, Live from My Drum Room with John DeChristopher, and also my YouTube channel, Live from My Drum Room with John DeChristopher. And while you're there on YouTube, check out my new show, Track Talk, iconic songs with iconic drum parts and the drummers who created them. It's really cool. Check it out. Shorter episodes. You'll love it. And Track Talk is only available as part of my Live From My Drum Room series on my Live From My Drum Room YouTube channel and podcast platforms. So please subscribe. All Live From My Drum Room and Track Talk podcasts are available on all the major podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, etc. I also want to give a big thanks to my friend Steve Gadd for providing the music for my show. That's really Steve. And remember, no drummers are harmed during any episodes of Live From My Drum Room or Track Talk. So drummers, remember, when in doubt, leave it out, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.